Welcome everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us today for Gardens and Grub. I have a very exciting topic for you, but first a few housekeeping details. Um, we're gonna talk for a few minutes about a food topic and then um, afterwards there'll be questions. So feel free to, in Zoom, um, raise your hand or put a question in the chat box um, or go ahead and um, uh, enter your uh, question in Facebook messaging if, uh, if you're on Facebook. So, okay, without further ado, today we're going to talk about capsicum, otherwise known as chilies or peppers. So, the reason that we call chilies peppers is because um, when Columbus discovered the New World, um, there was a Colombian exchange of different kinds of food. The foods that grew in the Americas got exchanged to um, the Old World, which is Europe. Um, and then there was an exchange of, of European foods to um, the Americas. So for instance, we didn't have anything really in the cabbage family or kale or collards or anything until that Colombian exchange. And the Old World, Europe, did not have things like corn, chilies, squash, things of that nature. So there was this big exchange and chilies were part of it. So the first chili I wanna show you is this one here. And it's called a chiltapin or a chili piquin is another name for it. And this is a nice little spicy pepper. It's quite delicious. Um, and if you ever look at any chili or pepper or sweet bell pepper, know that this is its common ancestor, a chili that looks just like this. So these still grow wild in what is current day Mexico, um, but chilies originally developed in, um, in what is now current day Mexico, South America, and Central America. So um, they're very rich in vitamin C, and based on uh, the Scoville scale, some, um, some chilies are gonna be uh, very mild and some will be very, very spicy, but they all started sort of medium spicy like this. They were, um, uh, it's a very genetically diverse group, but originally they developed actually this spice in them. And that spice called capsaicin um, is actually a protection from, uh, from mammals coming and munching on, uh, on the foliage and the fruit. Um, although birds do not have receptors for capsaicin. So these particular chilies that you can actually find um, in grocery stores, this perfectly spherical round one is, a very, is an heirloom variety that you have to grow. I haven't been able to actually purchase these um, since I left the desert Southwest. Um, we actually grow these at Briggs Avenue Community Garden. And um, so we can teach people about chilies when they come and see us. Um, but uh, they're rare to find um, and they still grow wild there and there are a lot of people who go out into the desert and they harvest these because they're about $60 a pound fresh um, when, when you buy you can buy and sell them out there. So um, let's talk a little bit about capsaicin. So capsaicin is the spicier, is the actual chemical that makes things spicy. Um, and it varies by the Scoville scale. Um, this is a sort of um, a genetic um, outcome of, uh, of chilies. So some of them can have zero, like in the case of a sweet pepper, and some can have millions and millions of them um, all the way up to a Carolina Reaper. So um, these actually grow um, in a nice dry soil, uh, a loamy soil that gets watered maybe once a week. Chilies like to be dry, whether it's a sweet pepper or whether it's a hot chili, they like it high and dry. Um, if you give these guys wet feet, they're not gonna be happy. So they're great to grow in containers. It's very easy to grow chilies pretty much anywhere that has a warm season um, of at least uh, three to five months, like a really warm season, you can grow chilies. So here in the Piedmont, um, most of our tomatoes and, and um, uh, cucumbers have crashed and burned at this point. And this is the time when the days are really long and warm. They're actually starting to get shorter. The days are because we're past the summer solstice. Um, but right now the peppers and the eggplants are kicking off like crazy. So all chilies and peppers um, are part of the Solanaceae family. And that is the family that includes potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, 
peppers, and tobacco. It also includes things like petunias um, because this is also called the nightshade family. So um, some people are allergic to these, some people can't digest them. I happen to love them and they're my very favorite thing. Um, what's interesting is just a regular organic square bell pepper can be up to $2.49 in North Carolina, which I think is a travesty because they grow so well here. I probably have 40 or 50 plants in my backyard and I don't have to do anything to them except for water them if it doesn't water for, I mean, if it doesn't rain for more than a week and a half. So um, I usually grow a ton of chilies and peppers, especially sweet peppers in the summertime because it's just so easy to do. Um, the hotter the pepper, bugs don't tend to touch it. Uh, the only thing that's really going to attack a hot pepper um, what might be a bird because birds do, do not have the uh, receptor for capsaicin um, in their digestion like we do and mammals do. So the reason we call these peppers is because in the Colombian exchange, pepper, black pepper, um, which is a completely different species family, these two aren't even related except for they're in, in, in the, you know, the plant family. Um, this is something that has been used for millennia um, to flavor meat. Um, it would also uh, take away sort of the taste of uh, meat that may have turned a little bit. Uh, so pepper had been popular in the old world of Europe for a very long time. And so when the Colombian exchange happened, they tasted this spiciness and it reminded them of pepper. So that's why we call it a chili pepper, but it doesn't really have anything to do with pepper, even though these kind of look, you know, the same. So that's pretty fun. Right now, currently, even though the uh, peppers and chilies all originated in the Americas and what is current day Mexico, India happens to be the number one producer of chilies. Um, it's the cheapest vegetable that you can get um, in India. So regardless of what level on the caste system you are there, um, you're gonna consume chilies um, in your home. So um, you can get, they have a huge diversity of chilies also available in India. So often when people will eat Indian food and it's spicy or Thai food when it's spicy, they think that those chilies have grown there from forever, but actually no, they came from Mexico and the Americas. So let's talk a little bit about pigments, okay? So these are the same species. They are the same pepper, actually. So often I grow plants for lots of people, and I'll ask what plants they're looking for. They say, oh, give me a green pepper plant. Well, the truth is all peppers are green pepper plants. Um, all unripe chilies are going to be uh, they're going to be green. They're going to start green. Now, you can harvest a green pepper and consume it, and if you're buying a green pepper at the grocery store, you notice that, it, that it's cheaper um, and a lot of times more readily available, um, and that's because it's an unripe pepper. They have a longer shelf life, um, but if you're buying a green pepper, know that if you let it ripen either on your countertop or on the bush, it's going to turn either red, yellow or orange, sometimes a pale green, sometimes white, depending on the variety that you get. But if you're buying a green pepper, it's an unripe pepper. Also botanically, if you're wanting to save seeds from a pepper, let it ripen all the way because you're gonna get better germination. Often if you pick these too young, the seeds are not 100% developed in them and um, they may not sprout the following year. So this one is called a corna de toro, which means bull's horn. And this is one of my very favorite peppers. It's the first time I grew it this year. This one's actually out of my backyard. And um, it's a sweet pepper. It has uh, zero Scoville units. It's absolutely delicious. Um, I don't grow very many hot peppers at home. Um, I grow a lot of hot peppers at the community garden because to me, they're absolutely fascinating. Um, right now, if you're able to stop by our Briggs garden on a Friday or Saturday morning, we actually have about 24 hot varieties growing from the mildest to the very, very hottest, and they all have signage and they're absolutely gorgeous. So um, stop on by if you get a chance. Um, just to show you that it really does develop is that you start with a green and then it's gonna go to red. The green pigment is called chlorophyll. And then as the red or yellow or orange develop, these are carotenoids. So I'm sure people have heard of beta carotene. Uh, carotene comes from carrot because carrot is orange and it has some uh, yellow and uh, red pigments in there. Beta carotene is a water soluble 
precursor vitamin to vitamin A. So vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin. And if you're taking it by, you know, by pills, you can actually overdose on, um, on fat soluble vitamins, but you can't on water soluble vitamins. Um, the fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K. Um, and then your B's and C's are your water soluble vitamins. So if you eat red vegetables, you're getting enough vitamin A in your diet because your body will turn this pigment into vitamin A, which you need for all kinds of body processes and coenzymes in your, um, in a lot of different um, biochemical cascades in your body. So this is a very, very sweet pepper. I wanted to show you really quickly, there's an intermediary color that you'll see in some peppers. Um, they're usually heirloom peppers, um, but there's an intermediary color. This is called a purple Muraski. And there are a lot of peppers that will develop a purple intermediary color. It'll go green to purple to red, yellow, or orange. Um, but if you're picking a purple pepper, it's still an unripe pepper. It's just in between. I'm sorry, I don't have a bigger one for you. This is the only purple pepper I was growing this year. But this is a mild little pepper. And, uh, and it's, it's delicious. Um, we're growing it in our demonstration beds just to show this intermediary color. But I'm of the opinion, if you're gonna grow a sweet pepper, grow a big sweet pepper because you get a lot more fruit um, and, and uh, for, you know, for the comparison of the amount of seeds. This thing is full of seeds, so you don't get a lot of flesh on it. Uh, shishitos are the same thing. Shishitos are another, like, um, I would say uh, the hipsters about five, eight years ago, you started seeing them on all the, like, the hip restaurant appetizer menus. And they're about the size of a jalapeno and people pick them green, even though they normally turn red, they pick them green and they fry them and charge $8 a, a plate for them. And um, to me, shishitos aren't that exciting because you get a lot of seeds and not very much flesh for the amount of trouble for growing, <laughs> for growing it and making sure it's water and fed. I like to grow big, beautiful peppers. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the Scoville scale. So again, my Corna de Toro is basically um, an artisanal heirloom sweet pepper. There's no capsicum development in this at all. Um, but this guy, my little Chiltepin, is kind of in the middle of the scale. It's slightly hotter than a jalapeno. The reason I always refer to a jalapeno is because that's what people have the most experience with because they'll eat jalapeno poppers or jalapenos on their nachos. Um, and a jalapeno is between 2,500 and 8,000 Scoville units, okay? And then this guy is a Carolina Reaper, and currently it is the hottest pepper in the world. We're growing this at Briggs Garden. Um, I cannot eat these peppers, but I try to always grow them at least once a year so that, uh, or at least, at least every year, if not every other year, um, to show people that this actually developed, was developed here in the Carolinas, and it has approximately 2 million Scoville units. So currently, it's the hottest pepper in the world. Now, there is an arms race constantly for people trying to create a hotter and hotter pepper. I don't really know why, um, but I, there are a certain groups of people that love hot peppers. And I respect these people, my father being one of them. He loves, 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 loves hot peppers. Um, we have receptors for these on our tongue, but we also have receptors for this capsicum all the way down our gut and all the way out. So this actually burns you <laughs> going all the way through your body. Um, there are people on YouTube that will eat these um, just so that people can enjoy their reaction to it. Um, one of these here would flavor gallons and gallons and gallons of curry or stew. It's really, really a lot. And I wanna put this up to the camera so you can see really closely. Do you see that blistering on there? The blistering indicates a super hot. So, um, there's uh, peppers called like death spirals, ghost peppers. A lot of these are going to have this blistering on the outside. When you see that blistering, tread carefully. These are extremely, extremely hot. So let's talk about the Scoville scale for a little bit. Because a lot of people don't know with the Scoville scale, how did this originate? So um, Wilbur Sco Scoville was a pharmacist that would dilute certain peppers and then have five different people taste them to see, um, you know, it's sort of a subjective scale of how hot it is to these five people. And then those five people who enjoyed hot food would determine relatively how hot something was compared to something else. Um, now, in modern days, they use um, high pressure liquid chromatography 
and they will, you know, buzz this up in um, some sort of emulsifier with salt water and inject it into this machine that can actually detect, um, you know, quantifiably how much capsicum, capsaicin is in the actual pepper. So that's a more accurate way because it's not, it's not a qualitative scale, it's a quantitative scale. It doesn't tell you how, it tells you how much. So, uh, you know, but Scoville is still a very popular um, way to determine how hot something is. So uh, this guy right here uh, is actually as hot as weapons grade pepper spray. So if you watch on YouTube and see how people are affected when they eat one of these, or if it gets on their skin, imagine being sprayed in the face with something like this. It's pretty bad. So uh, this level of pepper spray is actually not even uh, available to the general public. Um, you'll find um, stuff that's about quarter to a half this hot. Uh, in bear mace, um, mace and pepper spray that you buy for personal protection to put on your key ring. Um, it's never going to be as hot as that sort of um, uh, military grade or police grade pepper spray that comes in the big cans of like, you know, and it sprays out like hairspray. So um, we don't have that uh, level available to us. So just something to keep in mind. So when you hear pepper spray, it's not this pepper, it's this pepper. So um, something else that I wanted to talk about, which I, I found really, really fascinating uh, when I was doing research for you, um, capsicum already I knew and, and have used this, not this, but uh, something milder. Um, you can actually get patches and it's called, I can't remember, there's some brand names of it like Icy Hot and uh, capsaicin P and there's lots of other brand names but it's actually a mild form of capsaicin that they put in a patch or in a in a uh, liniment or cream to put on aching muscles and joints um, for for pain relief um, and it has a very warming sensation just like the warming sensation on your tongue when you eat a jalapeno if you rub it on your skin you're going to get that too um, i don't recommend taking just a pepper and rubbing it all over your skin because you don't know how hot it is it's best to buy it when it you know in the medical grade that you can get in um, you know the over-the-counter uh, applications because they have uh, the scientists and, and um, uh, factories have come up with a, a product that's going to be safe for you to use. It won't be too hot. So between pepper to pepper, there's going to be variability even on the same bush um, of how hot one pepper is to another. But especially if you have two different bushes grown on two different farms, um, even if it's the same variety and species and came out of the same packet of seeds, you're going to have variability in the capsicum content that um, was generated in those individual peppers based on the environment that the pepper grew up in. So don't go rubbing it on your skin, buy the stuff that, uh, that is already pre-made for you. The thing that fascinated me the most about learning about uh, capsaicin, uh, that it is actually not allowed to be used um, in equestrian sports. It blew my mind. It, you know, I love these food talks because I always learn like 10 new things um, about the food that we're, we're discussing on that day. And um, I was unaware that actually some equestrian sports people were disqualified during um, one of the recent Olympics, I think it was 2008, um, that they were disqualified because they actually swab uh, horses to make sure that uh, no capsaicin has been rubbed on them anywhere. Because apparently, even though they have receptors for it and it provides pain relief, it's also a stimulant for the horses. So it's considered like doping if they use capsicum on their horses, which I think is completely fascinating and out of this world. Um, but yeah, people have been de uh, disqualified uh, for it, which is interesting. Oh, another medical way that they actually use it on humans and animals is per, per, like peripheral neuropathies or neuralgia. So um, uh, neuropathy and neuralgia, neuralgia is nerve pain. So um, a lot of times either from like diabetes or um, sometimes in the cases of HIV, um, uh, lots of other um, ailments, the sort of byproduct of that is nerve pain. And so you can actually apply um, capsaicin to uh, to help that out and it's prescribed by a doctor so don't just go out and if you have nerve pain rubbing things on it um, but maybe one of those patches would work talk to your doctor about that no medical advice from here but um, just to know that this is actually used medically um, and um, for protection and then also in uh, culinary uh, 
you know, the culinary uses around the world, which is amazing. Uh, let's see, am I skipping anything? Oh, I have to tell you one other funny thing. So there's a uh, wonderful um, celebrity, international celebrity that I wanted to tell you about because uh, his videos on YouTube are fascinating and his name is Chili Klaus. Um, he is a uh, Danish composer and uh, conductor, uh, but he's also like internationally known for being a celebrity because he will go and eat hot chilies with uh, different celebrities in, in, his, in, um, in his country. And one of my favorite videos of his is Chili Klaus and the Classical Orchestra. So if you look that up, it's like four minutes long and he uh, eats a chili pepper with the Danish National Orchestra and they play this tango and it's amazing how you can like hear the pain in the music. Um, it's pretty fascinating. He also eats a hot pepper, not a really hot pepper, but for kids it's hot, um, with a, uh, a children's choir. Um, he, he eats these chilies all over the world with different people. Another fun one to watch, uh, if, if you've never seen it on the YouTubes, um, is uh, Hot Ones. That's a really fun show um, where uh, this gentleman, this interviewer, Sean Evans, will introduce um, different celebrities and they successively talk about their careers and eat successively hotter hot wings. And it's amazing to see how people start and they've got their regular sort of, you know, public facade on and that slowly breaks down over time as the wings get hotter. And he interviews everybody from musicians, comedians, scientists, politicians, you name it. Um, I don't know how many seasons um, the show has, but um, I have uh, been able to discover different artists that I listen to now and um, other comedians and things that I didn't know anything about, but because they were on Hot Ones, um, it, 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 suffice it to say, it's, it's uh, interesting and fun and a fun diversion during these challenging times. So um, consider that in, in your time. But I, I definitely recommend uh, Chili Klaus, four minutes of your time. It's totally fascinating. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions because um, I'm sure there are some about this interesting botanical family. For sure. So we already have our first one from Facebook. Um, yeah. This one is, um, are, will island peppers also eventually turn red? Island peppers? Island, yes, island peppers. Um, I, I'm not sure um, if you're harvesting them green, they're going to eventually develop some sort of carotenoids. So it'll either be red, yellow, orange, sometimes a really pale yellow will develop. Often you'll get, a, like not often, it's kind of rare, um, but there'll be a white pigment sometimes that will develop. Um, but a bright green chili is always gonna turn a different color. Um, okay, so follow up to that. What if you put it in the fridge? Will it continue to ripen in the fridge? It slows down the ripening, you know, pretty, and, and in fact, even if you buy them at the grocery store, a lot of times um, they've been refrigerated for so long that they often will not totally ripen. So if you leave them out, um, also a lot of times they've been waxed, so they, they may not eventually develop their color. They may shrivel up and look terrible on your countertop before um, you'll ever actually um, get a chance to, to enjoy the carotenoid development in them. Um, I have another question, just one moment. Um, how would you recommend adding, say, chili powder to ground beef to add flavor? So how oh. would you recommend adding, say, chili powder to ground beef to add flavor? Okay, so um, just your run-of-the-mill chili powder. Chili, all chilies, the, the flavors in chilies, most of them, especially the spiciness, they're fat-soluble. So the, uh, the capsicum oleoresin, it, it dilutes in fat. And so one thing that you can do is, you know, if you have a, like a more bright red chili powder, um, I tend to toast that dry in the pan just a little bit um, to give it, to get it started like you add kind of a more smoky flavor if you toast it just for a couple seconds in a hot pan and then put the meat in it. Or another way that you can do it is fry your meat until a lot of the water has um, um, evaporated off of it. And then you have that, you know, sort of like 
there's a little bit of fat in the bottom of the pan after, after a lot of the water has boiled off of it. And you can add it then and it's gonna toast in there. You can add it at any time and it's gonna be delicious, but you're gonna get the most of it, most of it if you either toast it dry or put it in when most of the water has um, evaporated. But I do recommend if you get a chance to make your own chili powder, because if you make your own, it's better than anything you can get in the store. Um, if you just go to you know, any of the international grocery stores, there's dried chilies of all kinds. And you know, especially if you're getting like a New Mexico chili, a Guajillo, um, um, a California chili, any of those are gonna be very uh, sweet, very mildly spicy. And then you just get yourself a, um, like I have a spice grinder and a coffee grinder because I'm a big food nerd. Um, they're two separate grinders, but you can wipe out your, your coffee grinder real, real good and use that and then wipe it out again so you don't have spicy coffee the next day. But grind it up and you can add like even a little granulated garlic in there. You can get like the chunks of garlic that are dried and grind it all up. And when you make your own chili powder, it's your very own. It's also nice to make it as gifts. If you want a cheap gift for Christmas or you're the holidays, make a whole mess of chili powder and then put it in the little jars and you can give it out and it's really lovely. It looked, sorry about that. I was looking back at the um, the question on Facebook to see if I got the name of the chili right. It might have been Lander Chili, I-L-L-A-N-D or something like that. What, what is it? <laughs> well, it was written Islander, but I, I was wondering if it might have been, yes, she corrected as I-L-A-N-D-E-R. Lander Chili, I'm not sure. I mean, there are, there are definitely island chilies because there's lots of islands that can grow chilies. Um, you know, there's certain ones known for the Hawaiian islands, certain ones known for Caribbean islands. Um, but suffice it to say, as a family, they start green. I mean, even when you look on this reaper, it's green here and it's turned red. So it's going to develop to another color. It always happens. Even with a yellow banana pepper, it starts green and then it turns this really pale, beautiful yellow. It isn't like the bright yellow of the bell pepper you get in the grocery store, but it's always going to develop some sort of carotenoids when it's ripe. Okay, cool. Um, I will be generous and ask our audience if they have any more questions before I ask my question. <laughs> so uh, audience, do you have any more questions? But Feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Otherwise, you're going to hear my question as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious from a biological perspective, why the blistering? Why does that happen? No, I don't know. It's just one of the outcomes of, I don't know if it's like little, you know, cells full of the, that oil. I'm not really sure. But you know, whereas there's, there was this opinion, and I heard this when I was a young child, and then it changed over time um, once I started to know more about it. But they say like, oh, the smaller the chili, the hotter it is. And that's not true because this one is, a, this is one is as sweet as a sweet pepper, and this one is bigger, and it's the hottest pepper in the world. So, you know, and, and also this one, this one, <laughs> my chiltepine is very much smaller and it's not hotter than this one. So, um, so yeah, it, it, I, I don't really know why it makes those blisters, but I know that we have a couple of other super hots at the garden and they all have that blistering. As they go down the line, um, it's like nice and then you go down and it's just absolutely blistering. So in future weeks, just so you know, we're gonna go back to doing a different food every week, but I'm gonna bring you a chili of the week for a while, because I've got so many beautiful ripe ones out there. And, um, and so I just want you to kind of see the genetic diversity of chilies of the world. And then through the winter, maybe we'll do dried chilies, because I probably have a collection of at least 35 or 40 of them at my house, so. Very cool. Um, I did get another question. Um, it is um, how to cut pepper for slicing into salads. Okay. so. This is a great question, by the way. When I teach knife skills, this is something that I actually teach. So the cellulose fibers, the indigestible fibers that give plant structure in a pepper always grow this way. And so if I'm gonna cut slices of a pepper that I'm gonna cook, I'm gonna cut it this way because I'll be able to cook it and it won't get mushy, even if I cook it longer. If I'm gonna serve it in a salad, I'm gonna cut like, like a box. Like I'm gonna cut these little sort of steaks off the side and then I'm gonna cut them this way into ribbons because I'm cutting against the grain of those cellulose fibers and it's gonna be much more 
toothsome and lovely to eat raw than if I cut it this way, where I'd have to chew through those fibers real hard. It's sort of like when you cut a steak, you cut against the grain of the muscle fibers. Um, it's the same thing with a pepper. You're gonna cut against the cellulose fibers so that it's more digestible and easier to chew. Awesome. Well, I think we are out of time, but thank you for this awesome session yet again. I have some follow-up questions for you, so maybe next week I will bring them since we're staying on peppers. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you.